In Joshua chapter 7, how many know that 7 speaks of purity, speaks of God, whereas 6 speaks of man? I always show that wherever God is, he brings correction because he loves us. We know that here in Joshua chapter 7 that Achan had sinned against the word of God. Sometimes, I mean, I'm not some, I believe that so often with Christians in our compromise, we will go to the scripture that says, if we have sin, we have an advocate Jesus, who's able and just to forgive us of our sin. And that is a wonderful scripture. Thank God that he provides a remedy for us. Yes. But what we also have to understand is that when we disobey God, when we walk out of his covenant, no ordinance, there are consequences. We're going to find out that 30-some that, uh, men died because of the consequences of another. You know, there could be consequences in my life that cause people injury or, or, or what have you. I think of someone that drinks and drives and they hit another vehicle. I mean, they're still the same person they was, but the consequences of what they did was something they could never take back. I've seen court cases where the person sits there and cries like a baby and pleads and said, only if, only if, only if. But it's too late. The consequences are there. And, you know, though I could go to prison and God could, I believe there are many people in prison who know the Lord. But the consequences of what they have done are long lasting and so we always have to say this Lord let me always be obedient unto you that your word would be so real in my life but I'm going to focus this morning on the fact that Abram who lived in Haran a, place, a dry and a barren place was called by God out of his kindred and unto a country that he would be shown later on that Abram was the first father of the church, the first father of many nations. That is where fatherhood in the spirit, uh, uh, you know, on this earth was uh, developed in the fact that Abram would, would hear the word of God and would obey it. And he said, in doing that, you shall be called the father of many nations. Nations, You know something, there is something about fatherhood this morning that gives us a great sense of sobriety, that we have a, 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 we have a responsibility in which to, to walk according to as God has spoken to us. But when we talk about dreams, I had a, a, a phone call, or should I say, I, I answered a phone call, or returned a phone call, should I say, to a cousin of mine, his name is Timothy, and he had a dream. And God used me to interpret that dream for him. And he was in a house, and his father, he was arguing bitterly with his father. And all of a sudden, he was taken out of the house immediately, and he was between two great white buildings. And as he stood between these buildings, a tornado came, a great wind, and it as if it was going to destroy him. He grabbed a four by four to try to brace it somehow to protect him, even though it was inadequate and not able to do so. God protected him in that tornado. And what God showed me in that dream for him is that we cannot go back into the past and just unjustify or to correct uh, uh, relationships that that uh, that may have been broken. But he says God has brought us into a new life. We cannot go back. He said leaving those things behind, and he said pressing forward. 
I said, Timothy, he puts you in a position between the kingdom of God on this earth and the kingdom of God in heaven. And he said, I want you to know something, is that the kingdom on, of, uh, on this earth, which we are, we're in the kingdom of God on earth, but yet with that comes battles and wars. But there's a kingdom to come, or should I say the fulfillment of the kingdom, in which there'll be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death, no more heartache, no more hurt. Oh, won't that be the day? But today, we do have... Uh, uh, you know, uh, the enemy is there today, as Peter said so eloquently. He said, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness. He says, uh, he said that the devil comes as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He said that we need to be sober and vigilant in this last day. We're in a war, people. And if you're not in a war, you're, you're, you're asleep. We're in a war today. And how are we going to overcome in this war? I'll tell you there's only one way is to know the overcomer. And to walk with him. And to talk with him. And to believe that he is able. He has the answers to every problem. But I want to, I, I look at Genesis 28. Um, 10 through 15. But first of all, uh, why don't we go there? Let's, let's go to Genesis 28. Check mark here. Amen. I will begin with the dream of Jacob. Genesis chapter 28. If you get there before me, just give me a minute. Thank you, Lord. Jacob had a dream in Bethel. It said, and Jacob went out from Beersheba and went to Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and he tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of the place and he put them for his pillow. How many have pillows like that? And he lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heavens. And behold, the angel of God ascended and descended on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. And the land whereon thou layest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and shall uh, spread abroad to the west, and the east, and the north, and the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee. I will keep thee in all places, whether thou goest, and I will bring thee again unto the land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken unto thee. And Jacob awakened out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob arose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for a pillow, and he set it upon a pillar, and he put oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel, but the name of that city is called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying if God will be with me and I will then I will keep and keep me in my in his ways that I go and I will that I will give uh, and give me bread to eat and remnant to put upon so that I come again and to my father's house in peace then shall the Lord be my God and this stone which he have been set 
for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I shall surely give the tenth unto thee. And so what we see here is that Jacob has a supernatural encounter with God. How many know we need a supernatural encounter today with the Lord? We need to realize that God is in total and complete control. What you have to realize in your life, we don't need to fret. We just need to know, God, you are in total and complete control. But let me tell you what happens when people feel as if all control is lost. I want to read Joshua chapter 7, verses 2 um, through uh, 5. It says, then Joshua sent men uh, uh, from Jericho to Ai. Now remember this, Jericho was a great victory for the children of God. It was a great victory. The Bible says, when we look at Jericho, how wide it was, the seven chariot uh, brass could, walk, could drive around the top of that wall. It was a massive wall. It was too high to get over, too, uh, too deep to get under, too wide in which to penetrate. It was an impossible uh, situation. But how many know where we face the impossible? God is able in your life. You may look at a situation with a, with a relationship, and you may say, it seems as if this is never going to change. This is never going to go right. And you know what God says? All things are possible with me. Are you looking to me? But I want you to know something with Jericho, is that he has specific instructions in which they would overtake that city. How many of the God has specific instruction today? That if we'll hear them, God will share them with us. When we talk about Nor and the Ark, we realize that he didn't say, go build the boat the best you can, and when you're done, I'll make sure that it floats. No, he said there is an exact uh, a way in which I expect it to be built. How many know our lives kind of represent that ark? That God is building in our lives in a specific and, and, and a correct way. And we need to be obedient unto the Lord. Well, what happened in Jericho was he said to them, he said, I want you to circle the city once every day. And here they would walk around that city and the people at the top of, the, of that great wall would laugh at them and mock them. And yet they were obedient. But the seventh day he said, there's a different thing. We're going to blow trumpets. We're going we're to sing. We're going we're to do things a little differently today. And the Bible said because they obeyed him that the walls, that the earthquake that God created caused those walls to fall. And the children of Israel were able to go in and penetrate that city and to take it for the Lord. I want to tell you right now, there's no wall too thick. There's no wall too high. There's no wall too deep. There's no wall too long that God cannot destroy, that God cannot bring down. How many know he is the same God uh, that he was with Jericho? And he's the same God today. And he can do today what he did then if we will believe and we'll have an ear and hear and we'll be obedient to what the Lord has to say. And we, we, we realize that God had, um, that they went, and let me read that again. It said, and Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside uh, Bethaven, on the east side of, of Bethel, and spoke unto them. Remember, Bethel was named by Jacob, just back in Genesis, from, from uh, Luz, to Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up, and they viewed Ai. And they returned to, to Joshua and said unto them, let, the, uh, let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and to make, and to make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. You know, when we begin to rest on yesterday's victories, we become sloppy in the war that's before us. When we begin to rest on yesterday's victories, we can easily become sloppy when it comes to the war. I'm going to tell you, every single battle is serious. That's right. 
Every single battle we need to prepare for. Every single battle we need to get the mind of the Lord for. Not to say, well, we took Jericho. How big that was. And God probably looked at them and said, you didn't take anything. I caused an earthquake to come and knock down those walls. And here now they're saying, oh, we are mighty. In fact, you know what? AI is so small in comparison to Jericho. We just sent a few thousand men up there. They're going to be able to easily take it. And so they returned uh, to Joshua and said, and let's go down to verse 4. So, there, uh, went, uh, so they went up uh, thither of the people, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai, and the men of Ai smote them about 30 and 6 men. For they chastened them from uh, before the gate, even to Shibram, and smote them in the going down, where, wherefore the heart of the people melted and became as water. Isn't that strange how they went? And see, that's, that's what it is when we become conceited, is that we're either way overconfident or we have no confidence at all. Why? Because we're looking at self rather than him. What you realize in this is that they had, number one, let me tell you this, they had not sought the Lord to make sure there's nothing in their lives that would keep them from the victory that was set before them. You know, we always have to say, Lord, search my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. Maybe the fact that I could overcome Jericho, maybe there's something that's crept in since then that doesn't, doesn't please the Lord. And God is more concerned with my soul than he is with my victories. God is more concerned with my soul than he is with my victories. And you know something? He said pride is a stench in his nostrils. And what we need to understand and realize in that is that we need to say, Lord, let me humbly stand before you, knowing that all the victories that, I may, have, that may have been wrought in my life are not a guarantee that the next war that I win if I don't surrender my complete and wholehearted unto you. It was a problem that they just overlooked. And that problem was is that AI... It is that uh, Achan had taken what God told him not to take. It affected the whole community. I'm going to tell you this. A little sin leaveneth what? Half the lump? The whole lump. You heard me say on more than one occasion that it was a lady that was with the Episcopal Church in uh, New Hampshire. And that what happened was is they voted in a homosexual bishop. And they found themselves being pushed out of the church if they did not agree with the agenda. And she said to somebody that was a member of this church, she said, well, how is it that we lost and they won? I'll tell you how. Because they allowed the sin into the sanctuary. They allowed the sin into the sanctuary. And I will tell you the sin once it is burned within the sanctuary, will push out everything that's holy. You see, he said, can bitter water and sweet water uh, come from the same fountain? The Bible says no. You can't mingle the two, either one or the, or the other, but when you begin to mingle it, I'll tell you what happens. Defeat becomes what the result of that sin. Some people will say, well, pastor, you're awful strict on certain things. Let me tell you something right now. I don't fool with sin because sin will destroy you. That's right. Sin will destroy me and sin will destroy you and sin will destroy them and sin will cause them to run from AI even though it's a much smaller order than Jericho was. What had changed? It's just a little gold. Nobody's going to miss it. Come on now. They've got all the... You see, what we begin to do is rationalize our little sins. You know what God says? I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. Why am I going to stop? Because I love you too much to let you fill your heart. 
with that nonsense. It said, let God's word be true and let every man be a liar. It's very serious, people. When Abraham prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah, how I many we're praying for this nation? But yet we have to say, Lord, your will be done and not mine. He prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah. They're already boiled down. Now, I'll tell you what he says. He said, I will send the angels unto Lot and to his family, and I will lead them out. Someday the Lord's coming. I'm going to tell you what this country would be like if God was to take his bride. All the workers would be gone. This country would fall into chaos so quickly you couldn't imagine it. But what happened, he went there in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he, he told, and the angels, even though the angels went there, let me tell you what sin does. Sin even tried to break down the door to rape the angels. Don't think that sin, if let into the camp, that's what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't believe it was always that way. We've got to realize one thing is Lot was, he, he was a member of the gate, which meant he was a politician himself. He was like the few Demo Republicans to the majority of Democrats. The Bible said that Lot's heart was vexed yes. with what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God is saying that unless I destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, it will corrupt the whole world. Because that's what sin will do when it's allowed to exist. It will corrupt the church. It'll corrupt. What God wanted us to be victorious, it can corrupt that. But what we realize in this is that AI had, had smitten 30 so But you know what I love about the story? It doesn't end there. You know this hope in our lives? Even when we commit a sin? God is saying, listen, I'm patient with you. I want you to learn by it. I don't want you to stay in it. I'm not going to let you have the victory that you want in your life until you're willing to deal with it. God gave them a remedy. He said, take Achan and his family out and stone them. Now you say, well, that seems awful drastic. Unless you destroy, ultimately destroy the enemy, it will always continue to work in your life. I've known many Christians who had come to the Lord. They were in the kingdom, but their whole life in the kingdom was turmoil because they did not make a decision to say, let all sin be eradicated in my life. You see, when you allow sin to have any place in your life, it will keep you weak. It will keep the Holy Spirit from moving in and through you. And that's what we've got to say. Lord God, I want your Holy Ghost. We wonder why the church today has become so weak. And I will tell you why. Because too many people have allowed pornography and other things to come in. And they need to deal with it because if they don't, the power of God cannot be in the house. Why is it, Lord, that I, you know, we, we go through the motions, but we're, we're, we're not seeing the results of what God has said. It's not that I don't want you to see the results. I love you too much to let you prosper in the midst of that thing that you allow and you permit. Wow. Isn't that a little radical, Pastor? Don't you realize the age we're living in? Don't you know that things have changed? You want to go back to that funny died old stories? They, this, this isn't all relevant today. Don't you know? Heaven and earth shall pass away. Amen. But my word right. shall never pass away. Thank you, Lord. This is a wonderful story. It's not negative. It's positive. Right. All God is saying here, yeah, you've had defeat, but deal with those sins, and, and, and I'll give you the instructions on eradicating them. I was listening 
yesterday to Mario Murillo. And he said this, he said, there's too many Christians that are looking for a quick fix rather than to do the work that God has told them to do. He said, every time I have a problem in my life and all of a sudden I've got a sin that I need to overcome, I think I'm demon possessed. Because you know why? Because someone can come and say, out of him in Jesus' name. And guess what? I go along and I don't have any dealings with that anymore. I'm free. And, and he said, that is a lie. I'm not saying that demon possession isn't real. We know that the Gadarenes, we know Jesus dealt with demon possession. I have dealt with demon possession. And I do believe in demon possession. But let me tell you what. Every time we have a little problem, we want a devil cast out. When God says, why don't you just pull up your sleeves and go to work and overcome it. You know, that's what the word discipline means. We see the devil and everything. I remember as a young man called to the ministry. I had two pearly handled 45 calibers and I would shoot anything that even looked like the devil. And probably a lot of good people were wasted. You know, I'm just saying that in a metaphor. <laughs> in, inexperienced, without the proper skill. But I've grown a lot since then. But the thing that we need to understand and to realize is that sin will destroy the camp. 37, 30, I think it was 37, innocent people died because of the actions of one. Think about that. Actually, it was 36 men. So what do you do when your dreams are shattered? Number one, we realize you've got to look inward and say, Lord, uh, my dreams are shattered. What is it that hinders me? It may be the devil. It may be your own lack of stand. You see, what Moses said this, because what happened, he had Korah. He had problems. You know, in every church, you have problems. Those who think this is the better way, those who think that's the better way. And finally, it became such a dissension between them that Moses was told by God, take a step or draw, to draw a line, and they that would come on this side, and they that wanted to be with Korah and his, and his people. And what happened was there is those that sought Korah and not what God, how many know God points who he will? How many know the, the, the pastor is appointed by God? It's not an elected uh, 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 office. It is an appointment. And in everything, we need to realize that God does everything decently and in order. And he never breaks his order. Ever does he break his order. But Korah thought he knew better than Moses. And he said, go ahead and tell them, those that be, with, with me to come and stand with Moses and those that be with them. Go ahead and stand with Korah. And the Bible said that God opened the earth and all of those that stood with Korah were swallowed up. It's a serious thing. Now I think when we talk spiritually today, to be swallowed up could be to, to live in despair, to live in, uh, without harmony, to live uh, with, with uh, all kinds of different things. That are not holy, nor right. But Joshua, in Joshua, God's people have finally crossed over to take possession of the land. They erected a memorial stone to remember what God had done for them. In chapter 7, we read about the defeat of Ai and its reason. Crossing over the Jordan is not a type of entering heaven. I've heard people say, oh, that's a type of enter in heaven. No, it is not a type of enter in heaven. It is a type of entering into the kingdom of God on this earth. Why? Because in heaven there's no giant. In heaven there's no there, there, there is none of that. When we get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that'll be. When they crossed the Jordan, they crossed into a land that God would give them. But there are going to be battles on this earth until the day we die. Why? Because we're training for reigning. God is making us into spiritual sons, both male and female. 
He's making us into spiritual sons that can overcome through the Spirit of God. The Bible said that they that overcome it, he said, I will grant to sit with me in the throne. Hallelujah. And they shall rod, rule with the rod of iron. You see, you don't just rule because you say, Jesus, forgive me. You rule because you go through this life. <coughs> and you conquer everything that God allows to be put before you. When God could do it himself in a second, the Bible said in Gethsemane when they came to arrest Jesus, that they said, where is he? And he said, here am I. And the Bible said that over 360 soldiers, including Judas, all fell backwards. Totally prostrate before the presence of the Messiah. I'm going to tell you what, there is power in the name of Jesus. He said, I could call down 12 legions of angels. And that was th hundreds of thousands of angels. One angel in one night could destroy a whole city. I'm telling you right now, what power that Jesus had before him. But you know what? He did not use that power because he wanted to, he wanted to die that you could have that power. We have power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Why does, it, why does the church live so feeble if there's such power to give? He said, my people, and Hosea said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. But he chased them before the gates of Shebron. And the word Shebron there is the ruins. And struck them down the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like what? I know Christians whose hearts seem to have melted. I want you to know something. I have all the confidence of the world in my God today. I believe that when we speak, we should speak with authority. That's right. That's right. The Bible said when they went out to see John the Baptist, they spoke, they saw a man speaking and the authority of God. You cannot speak in his authority if you don't walk with him. We need to begin to speak with authority today. John said, what did you expect when you came out to see a reed shaking in the wind? A reed is a hollow, uh, you know, something with no strength. And, and what they found was a man filled with the Holy Ghost and power. Amen. A man instilled with the word of God. A man that told them they needed to repent. Amen. Yes. Amen. In Joshua, God's people have finally crossed over to take possession of the land. They erected memorials I just read earlier in chapter 7. The crossing over the Jordan is not a type, as I've said, of the entering of heaven, but it is an entering into obedience with God and with his kingdom. We'll deal with the reality of that defeat. Their hearts melted like wax. They turned their backs to the enemy. The enemy routed, uh, uh, routed or broke them as, as Shebron. Their memorial stone was broken. Their dreams shattered. But right before them, in the meaning of the names and symbols of the place, came the answer to restoring broken dreams of God. You see, God already knows that we will encounter circumstances. You will encounter circumstances in your life. There are people who will say, well, you come to God and you live happily ever around. Let me tell you, you come to God and you'll end up in a war. You'll end up in an army that will war against the evils of the day which we... I'm at war right now. I'm at war against principalities and powers. I'm at war against Satan and, and his imps. I'm at war against every evil thing right now in Jesus' name. And I'll tell you, it has impact. And it's that word that's going to continually go forward in faith. You see, God already knows what we will 
that we will encounter circumstances in our lives and that will seem like total defeat, but already, but he already has a remedy for such encounters. I'm going to tell you what, he is the answer for everything this nation faces. It's not Donald Trump. We pray for him. The enemy comes out against him. But our answer is Jesus. I believe that half the Republican Party needs to get saved. And I'm believing for them to get saved. Amen? Because when they come on our side and want to scratch their head and wonder what it's all about, we need to say, look, there's Jesus. This is what it's all about. Yes. Joshua 4, 21 through 24. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their father in time to come, saying, What means these stones? Then shall ye let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry ground. And the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before, uh, before you, until ye were passed over as the Lord your God did it in the sea, Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. Mighty is my God. You see, there were stones here erected in the 50s. That it would ever be a reminder of the saints, and I knew some of those wonderful saints that just loved Jesus, yes. who have gone on now. But we realize that our testimony can be, can be stones of remembrance of what God has and will do. I think of 1 Peter 2 and 5, it said, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? We are those lively stones. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Shebron. The meaning is to be broken and fractured, specifically of dreams. After the uh, uh, repulse of the first attack on the city of the men of Ai, uh, in which they chased the Israelites, even to Shebron. The revised version margin reads, the quarries. The Septuagint reads, until they were broken, until the route was complete. Here, Israel was broken and routed by the enemy from Ai to the Amorites and their dreams were shattered. I'm going to tell you this right now. That's a good place for the church to be because I'm going to tell you what happens. God awakens the church in those times. I believe the church has been, been, been chased in this, in this Hebron. I believe that the, the church has been brought into a hard place. And what God has said, listen, number one, I want you to look inward and, 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 and allow me to search your heart. That if I find any wicked way in you, that you'd be willing to repent of it. That it would equip you now to go forward. I believe that, that, that there's a sleeping giant that's been awakened in America. And it's called the believers of Christ. I'm beginning to see it. Every time we have guests on our radio program, these are people out there doing the work of the Lord. Let me tell you something. They, every one of them have a champion-like spirit. Amen. We are out on the front lines and we are believing. The sin in the camp, what is it? And James 4, 17 said, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Sin is like plaque in the artery of faith. It will hinder us from the victories that God has for our lives. God is saying, cleanse your filthy hands, O children of God, and come unto me and watch what I can do through the power. As I said to Timmy, as he had, uh, Timothy had that dream, 
He was back in his father's house. He was still arguing with his father who's passed on many years ago. You see what it was is God said, you're stuck in your past. Still going back and trying to fight battles that we cannot fight. We're still trying to understand things. And God took him out and he put him between two kingdoms. The kingdom of God on this earth and the kingdom of God in heaven. I'll tell you this right now. We've got to let the past go. Amen. We've got to stop allowing the past to dictate our future. Yes. I've heard people say, well, I'm not good at math. How do you know you're not good at math? Well, I never was. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes. If God says I can do it, I can do it. When God called me to preach, I couldn't preach. I couldn't preach my way out of a paper bag. I would say, God, you've surely made a mistake because there's nothing within me that is going to allow me to do that. I'm nervous. I'm you know, all kinds of things. God said, what I call clean, call thou not unclean. What I've called to ministry, he said, don't you know I take the broken things of the earth? I take those things that are discredited by the world. Amen. I take those things that are weakness to the world's eyes and I set them in a position so that when they look upon you, Bob, they'll say, surely this is the hand of God. Amen. He does the same thing in your life. And he does it in mine. They were, they were overconfident. They had one great victory in Jericho, and we talked about that in John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Amen. One of the things I will tell you about me is I'm very stubborn. I will make something move. Is that a good quality? Not always. I mean, I do like the fact that I will stand against opposition until the day I die. But sometimes we get stubborn about things and God never asked us to lift. And we, oh, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to make it work. I'm going to make it work. God said, you can't do a thing without me. I remember one time we had a group downstairs and they had a big, one of those big pianos. My wife will tell you that I brought a piano. I unloaded it from a truck to put it in my house all by myself. And these things weigh over a thousand pounds. I did it with sure, brute stubbornness. I got the thing halfway in the door and I brought back my Jeep up, said, hold the fold before right there. And I said, and I'll back that thing into the house. I would, stubborn. One day the piano was downstairs and I wanted to let them know what I could do. And I went to lift on that piano and the only thing I did is broke wind. <laughs> that piano didn't move one bit. I'm sitting there red-faced. <laughs> Thinking, what a fool you've made of yourself. See, that's what stubbornness can get you. But I want you to know if you walk in the spirit, not in your flesh, then all things become possible. He said in John 15, 7, he said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. What, what is the prerequisite? That I abide in him and he in me. You know, if you ever look at an acorn seed, you know the acorn seed has within it a tree. In other words, I have Jesus within me, and yet I am in Jesus. After, the, after dreams are shattered, there are two oppositions uh, or two places that we can choose to go. We can go to Beth Avon. Beth Avon meaning the house of vanity and nothingness. From an unused root, perhaps meaning properly uh, to, to, um, to pan, thus, thus to... Um, Exert oneself, as I said, uh, usually in vain, to come to naught, strictly nothingness, also trouble, vanity, wickedness. We can go there. It reminds me 
of, of Ecclesiastes where the writer says this. This was Solomon. He said, it is all vanity and meaningless. All is vanity, vexation of spirit. That's the King James. Because let me tell you something. When you walk outside the counsel of God, depression will set in. You don't need pills for your depression. You need Jesus. Depression sets in when we feel like we've gone into, we've entered into something that with the Lord is not. Now, too, when you enter into sin and when you enter into uh, somebody else's sin, you enter into a land that, let me tell you, that will bring depression and hopelessness. You see, when dreams are broken by the enemy in the quarries of Shebron, they can travel uh, to places and stay there. We can live our lives here and never dream again, or we can go to Bethel. I am determined, I've made up my mind. I'll serve the Lord. Amen. I'll head for Bethel. At the last men's conference, I met a man. And he said he goes to church down there in the southern part of Maine. He said, for 40 years, he said, I didn't go to church. He said, I got mad at the church. You see what he did? Is he went to the wrong city. Rather than going to Bethel, he went to Achebra. And the thing that we need to understand and realize is for 40 years, he said, he lived outside the counsel of God. And when his wife died, the chaos in his own life and looking and realizing that he needed to return to the house of Bethel. Aren't you glad for God's mercy? He was an old man. He said, I've only been coming to church for a year. 40 years because of, of a... Disagreement. He never told me what that was. He separated himself from the church. Instead, he, instead of going to Bethel, he went to Beth Haven, the place of, of obscurity and, 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 and a place uh, that is dry and barren. You see, Bethel means house of God, the God, God's house. It is related to Jacob's dream, as we read earlier. It is the place of dreams, built upon the ground of truth, where God chooses to establish truth. In Deuteronomy 14 and 27, it said, And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn and wine and of the oil and of the fatlings and of the herd of the flock, thou mayest learn to, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord your God. How many of God chooses and we follow? You see, Cain chose what he was going to give to God. And he brought it to God and it was a sacrifice. And I'm sure the vegetables were very good to eat. And God looked at them and he rejected them because you know what? It's not what God chose. There's an old saying that, 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 um, that good intentions have paved the way to hell. Or should I say the way to hell is paved with good intentions. God doesn't want our good intentions. He wants our faithfulness. He wants our obedience. And he chooses who he will. He chooses where he will. Why do you think there's so much trouble in Israel? And I want to read that uh, here it says, for the Lord, this is in Isaiah 14, 1, it says, for the Lord will have mercy upon Jacob and will choose and will yet choose Israel to set them in their own land and the strangers shall join with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Let me tell you, you know who the strangers are? You and me, the Gentiles. And that we will cleave to the house of Jacob. There are no Christians that are anti-Semites. They're not Christians. They're, they're imposters. There's no Christian that says Israel has no right to the land that they have. It's the only nation on earth that's been given title deed to the land 
by a covenant that God made with Abraham. This is a land that I have given you. Why all the trouble? Why is it that a little land, a little land so small on this whole earth is the focus of all the trouble? Because it's where God resides because he chose to. How I many know God lifts up who he will and he puts down who he will? He is God. We have no right to educate him or to tell him what he should or shouldn't do. We just need to be obedient. I've known people that were anti-Semite and, and using excuses like, well, this evil Jew and that. Well, there were always been evil. They're evil Jews. But because there's an evil Jew doesn't say, well, that just that, that uh, takes away the word of God and what God chose to do. He chose to use Jacob and his descendant as the blessing. What you're finding over there is the, the Muslims are saying, no, we're of our Abraham father. A father is our Abraham, should I say. Abraham, should I say, is our father. I'll get it right. And he is through Ishmael. But God didn't choose Ishmael. How many know God chooses who he will? He lifts up who he will. So in other words, every single Middle Eastern has got to bow to the God of Jacob. Out of the loins of Jacob, Christ came. Well, I don't think that's fair. That's your problem. God will choose who he will, and we better get on board with it because he's not going to change for you and me. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm going to hurry on here. For the Lord will have mercy upon Jacob. Israel was born in the loins of Jacob. He said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but it will be called Israel. There's where Israel was born right there. Wasn't born in Abraham, but it was born from the loins of Abraham in the seed, which was Jacob. Remember, he had Ishmael and he had Isaac. And God said, I've chosen, I've chosen Isaac and his descendants in which my glory would flow. And we might as well get on board with that. In 1 Peter 2 and 4, it said, To whom coming unto uh, us unto a living stone, disallowed indeed by men, but chosen of God and precious. 1 Peter 2, 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. When it says nation, it means ethnos. It means that when we get born again, we, we become a new ethnos. A holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God chooses. The result of revelation, faith is revelation that is responded to. And in Romans 10, 17, and so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. In Matthew 13, 43, it says, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. I just want to get to the end of this, and I've got one more page. So just be bearing with me a little bit. It is the place where oil is poured upon the stones. Dream. And when we dream, the oil of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comforts us, teaches us, guides us into all truth. We need the Holy Ghost, and we need to be able to hear him. I'm telling you right now, the Holy Spirit is here for everyone who will receive it. We can explain it away because we have certain criteria in our minds, our intellect, but God said, your ways are not my ways, saith the Lord, and my ways are not your ways. You can't receive the Holy Ghost in your own thinking or mind. He said, when you ask for the Holy Ghost, he said, will I give you a serpent? Will I give you 
a, a, a stone for a loaf of bread? Will I trick you? No. He said, I will give you the Holy Ghost. Nobody has ever been filled with the Holy Ghost without, without uh, uh, being um, apprehensive. Because the devil comes in, in, in a, like a flood and he will try to tell you you're going to be possessed and you will be. Number one, you can understand that you're going to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. So you've got to want to be possessed. You've got to want to, uh, to, to, to uh, surrender yourself. You've got to want to surrender your mind. You're going to want to surrender your, 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 your compass and your way. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1 and 2, it said, For the which cause I, shall, uh, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know, we, 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 we fail to quote the first part. For the which cause I suffer these things. We've been told that you come to Jesus and everything will be happy and merry. And, you know, if you've got troubles, that means somehow you're not walking the way you should. No, when you walk the way you should, you'll have troubles. Because Satan will attack you. There is much meaning in Bethel. Jacob was fleeing uh, in defeat, headed for Haran. Isn't that something? He was headed back to the, the, the dry and the barren place that Abram had come out of. And you know what that? They served and worshipped the moon god. He was headed directly back into paganism. Aren't you glad that when you're headed that way, God will wake you up and say, no, 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 you don't want to head that way. There's much meaning when we look at Bethel. As Jacob was fleeing for Haran, he had relatives there. That's where his grandfather had died, probably would find his stone there. We can all go back to something familiar, but I want you to know it will be dry and it will be barren in comparison to what God wants for each and every one of us. You see, Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the pillow in which we should rest. He is the strength of each Christian. I'm going to close with one verse. In Zechariah 4 and 6, it said, And he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord under Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, I will, uh, I will see these things come to pass, that what will you do? Do we have to ask a question? Do we believe God today? Are we going to believe CNN? Are we going to believe MSNBC? Are we going to believe Fox News? Or are we going to believe the scripture? I'm going to tell you right now, when you read the scripture, it is more accurate than any news broadcast. In fact, not only is it accurate for today's news, it's accurate for tomorrow's news and the next day's news and the next day's news until the Lord himself comes. It's accurate. Get your news from the word of God and you will stand in victory. Would you stand with me, please? You can be filled with the Holy Ghost in your bedroom. You can be filled with hope. I'm going to tell you right now, we need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Intellectual knowledge of the word is not enough to get you through. We need the power. And I'm going to tell you, there's nowhere in this Bible where it says that that was for something then. The God, Jesus specifically says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. There's something supernatural about the Holy Ghost, and we can know him, and we can receive him. There are many people that would dispel it or try to rationalize it, but I'm going to tell you, you'll never rationalize God. They do it with creation by saying that there was something beforehand and 
that these rocks are 100 million years old and they spit out numbers like they know what they're talking about when it's nothing but foolishness. That's what the Bible said. He said, ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. He said, ever learning, they become fools. And I'm going to tell you this right now. We can know him. We can walk with him. And we can, we can have him in our hearts. And I, I just encourage each and every one of you, if you've not been filled with the Holy Ghost, if you have not spoken in tongues, I am here to tell you that it's here today and it's real. It's real, it's real. I know I know it's real. It's a Pentecostal blessing. And I know I know it's real. And if it ruffles feathers, that's, that, that's too bad. But I want you to know something. I'd rather walk in the glory of God than in the carnal mind of a human being. Let us go to the Lord in prayer today. Dear Father, as our father Abraham, Lord, obeyed you and followed you and came out of that horrible place called Haran unto a land that flowed with milk and honey. Let us, Lord God, walk in your glory, walk in your provisions, because in my father's house, even the servants eat better than the husk of the pigs that this world will give. Lord, help me, Father, to walk in you and in your counsel. And Lord God, that the whole counsel of God would be real in my heart. That I would ask that the Holy Spirit would enter into me, not wavering in thought, knowing that your word is true. Lord God, even though apprehensive, Father, I ask you, Father, that you would fill each and every one in this house with your precious Holy Spirit. God, that that spirit would lord in their lives, overcome their carnal thinking, and empower them in the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Lord says, seek me as I can be found, but I'll not always be found. Watchman, watchman, what of the night? And the watchman said, it's too late. The lion has come and he's devoured. I don't want to hear that word. I want to hear that today is the day. Today is the day to enter into his rest and receive that power of Jesus' name. May God be with you. You are dismissed. And I love every one of you. Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes. Hi there, young lady. Did you color? I love you. Did you know that?